There are so many franchises out there, whether it be movies, shows, books, or whatever else. And we've seen some of these franchises thrive, but end up bombing in the last season, the final film, the final book, and so on. And it's a real shame. The biggest example of this is Game of Thrones, which was incredible throughout and had the chance to be one of, if not the best show ever made. But people will always remember it for its terrible ending. Harry Potter has the opposite effect on this, however. This is my final video essay for the 8 Harry Potter films, though I'm still going to do the Fantastic Beast films. But if you watch my other video essays on the other films, I praised some of them, but I also bashed a few. It's true that a few of them really let me down, most notably The Goblet of Fire, The Half-Blood Prince, and Deathly Hallows Part 1. But the thing is, everything was redeemed when Deathly Hallows Part 2 gave us the ultimate ending to the Harry Potter franchise. In this video, I'm going to explain why Deathly Hallows Part 2 is the perfect wrap-up and why I think it's so great. Brilliant. First of all, I would just like to point out how hard making this movie must have been. Not only was it the ending to a beloved 10-year film franchise, which in itself holds so much pressure for the filmmakers, but they were working with half a story due to the book being split into two parts. In my last Harry Potter video essay, I pointed out how part 1 let me down because it wasn't a whole story, and therefore it left me very unsatisfied, and part 2 had the same dilemma, but they were able to make it work. On top of that, probably the most difficult thing they had to do was cut together a huge and epic battle, but all they had to work with from the book was Harry's point of view of the battle, and during most of it, he wasn't in the center of the action, but always off on his own with Ron and Hermione. So the filmmakers had to create their own aspects of the battle, and we know that when people who were not the author begin writing in their own view or outcome of the story, it can get pretty messy. This was the exact downfall of the Game of Thrones finale. In Deathly Hallows Part 2, however, the things they added were all perfect, from us seeing the teacher's point of view when protecting the school. Hogwarts is threatened. Man the boundaries, protect us. Do your duty to our school to seeing what Neville, Ginny, and Seamus were doing while the trio were off on their own. That went well. It was also such a good idea to have us see little shots of those we know are going to die in the battle right before everything goes down. Lupin and Tonks reaching for each other's hands was so powerful, and the Fred and George scene was heartbreaking. You okay, Freddy? Yeah. Me too. I also love seeing Voldemort's point of view during the battle, from him seeing the shield go up, They never learn. Such a pity. To him talking to Nagini and keeping her safe, and the best part, seeing his reaction when the Horcrux was destroyed. <laughs> Though following Harry's point of view of the battle worked really well in the book, books don't naturally translate to a movie. You have to adapt them, especially for a sequence like the Battle of Hogwarts. So by adding all of these scenes that are from the point of view of other characters, it makes the film and the final battle so much more exhilarating, and it actually feels like a war movie. I would argue that the book does not feel like a war novel, because though a war is taking place, we're mostly alone with Harry who wasn't part of the fight. He was off on his own, because the whole point of them fighting was to buy Harry time to find and destroy the Horcruxes outside of the battle. What is it you need? Time. Professor, as much as you can get me. Do what you have to do. Speaking of this being a war film, the visuals were absolutely spectacular, and it was so amazing and also heartbreaking to see the camera pan around the castle and see all the different places we're so familiar with get destroyed. They also did some very interesting CGI that was nothing like we'd seen in previous films, but it's fitting because this film is nothing like the previous installments in the series, and that CGI turned out super well. The success of the battle on the big screen is in large part due to the editing. Before this channel took off, my ambition was to become a film editor, so I myself look very deeply into how a film is put together, and I have to say, the editing job done by Mark Day is exquisite. I praised his editing job for The Order of the Phoenix when I made my video essay for that movie, as he perfectly cut together montages that added so much to the overall story arc with the DA meetings. However, the montages in The Order of the Phoenix were much more lighthearted, and his editing job there added to the film in a very different way than his editing job in the 8th film did. In Deathly Hallows Part 2, they did what's called scene placement using B-roll. B-roll is defined as supplemental or alternative footage intercut to the principal photography. This was used flawlessly in The Prince's Tale, and they used B-roll in a way that was very rare and pretty original. The B-roll I'm referring to is Snape going to Godric's Hollow to see the Potter's house destroyed and the love of his life dead on the floor. 
Those shots are b-roll because it doesn't have audio, it's not mentioned as a flashback by any of the characters, nor is any character specifically referring to these moments, and most importantly, it's used as filler in between the main scenes. B-roll is not normally used in this way, and to be honest, it's not normally used in films like this, though it's not unheard of. B-roll is meant more for documentaries or news segments, but the use of B-roll here adds an insane amount to the prince's tale. And let me explain. We jump from memory to memory, each its own scene, and as we go over each scene, they show B-roll of Snape getting closer and closer to the Potter's house, and eventually the B-roll is actually intertwined with what the actual main scenes are saying, first mentioning Harry's father and cutting to Snape seeing James' dead body, then Dumbledore talking about Harry being a horcrux and cutting to B-roll of Harry with his fresh scar. And finally, when Snape admits his love, it cuts to B-roll of him holding Lily's dead body. <laughs> all this time. Always. This same technique is done later on in the final battle, though here it's two main scenes that are intertwined, not b-roll, but it's the same concept. The scenes I'm referring to are Harry fighting Voldemort and Neville rescuing Ron and Hermione and killing Nagini. Putting these scenes together once again adds so much, because Neville killing the snake instantly changes the whole dynamic of Harry and Voldemort's duel, because now, Harry is able to kill Voldemort now that all of his horcruxes are destroyed. The two scenes play off one another in a very harmonizing way, and again, this is due to the fabulous editing job done by Mark Day. There are many more examples of this, especially during the actual battle, and by making the point of view for each person in the battle flow together seamlessly, it makes for a very thrilling and more spread out and expanded war story. Another example of perfect editing in this movie is its opening. Not a word of dialogue is said, nor does it have to be said when there are such incredible visuals. It starts where we left off in part 1 with Voldemort getting the Elder Wand, then it cuts to Snape at Hogwarts, then we see Dobby's grave reminding us of his death, then it cuts to a distraught Ron and Hermione, and the silence is ended by Luna, the optimist, and a character that the film shapes so perfectly, making her the perfect character to begin the dialogue in the film. Breaking this down, this is literally perfect. These scenes cut together give us a recap of the last film, but in the most subtle way, first showing Voldemort getting the Elder Wand, and then showing Dobby's grave. But it gets even better, because not only does it give us a recap, but at the same time, it shows us where the film is headed by showing Snape at Hogwarts. It blends this foreshadowing of where the main chunk of the film is going to take place, and balances it so naturally with the recap in the most refined way. Alan Rickman just nails his silent performance. You see so much going on in his face and eyes, so much conflict. Then, cutting to Ron and Hermione, who look distraught, show that everybody is down because of Dobby's death. But then, as I said, Luna, the light of the series, comes in and makes all the conflict and darkness we just saw vanish as she speaks about how beautiful Shell Cottage is. It's beautiful here. It's the most incredible opening you could ask for, and I think it's by far the best opening of any of the eight films. Looking forward, the editing job gets even better. We start off slow, and then tension builds and builds during Harry's questioning of Gripbook and Ollivander. The use of music here is really well done, because as their conversation gets more and more intense, the music becomes less comforting and more heart-pounding. I'm afraid you really don't stand a chance. Then the questioning sequence ends with Harry saying the most badass line. Well, I suppose I'll have to kill him before he finds me then. Then it cuts to the next sequence, carrying with it all the tension from the last scene as their plan of breaking into Gringotts begins, and from there on, it doesn't look back. It's all action for the foreseeable future, as they break into Gringotts, escape on a dragon, head to Hogwarts, and then the huge battle. And because there's all this action, the slow intro was vital, because the film picks up halfway through the book and when the book becomes the most intense. We needed these slow moments to build into the more intense moments, because otherwise, it would have been like wham bam, action right in your face as soon as the movie started. Starting with action works for some films, like Star Wars, but because Harry Potter is based on novels, the novels start slow and then ease into action. It's not easy to go from slow to fast moments so seamlessly, especially when you pretty much have to make up scenes to do so. There isn't a natural opening, they pick up right in the middle of the story, so the filmmakers had to develop an opening, and they pretty much just put this challenge in Mark Day's lap. 
When looking at the deleted scenes, Mark Day's editing once again shines through because he ensured that the opening kept the pace it did. They almost added two very slow scenes after Harry questioned Griphook and Ollivander, first with a very slow-paced conversation with Bill and Fleur. This is the closest I could find to what you described. Perfect. Thank you, Fleur. You're leaving, aren't you? And then another very slow deleted scene when Harry talks with Luna before they leave for their mission. The sky has lost a star. My father used to say that when a child died. If only how Mr. Darby knew exactly where to find us. Yeah. That's funny. Both of these scenes would have completely ruined the momentum they worked so hard to build. And I know some of you might be saying, but Morgan, you criticized the seventh movie for cutting deleted scenes, and the seventh movie sort of has the same opening. And to you, I would say that the scenes they cut in part one were vital scenes, especially Dudley and Harry's moment that was a crucial part of the book, while the scenes they cut in part two weren't really necessary and didn't cut anything important from the novel. And to those who say that part one had the same opening as part two, yes, you're right. If you just completely ignore the huge mistake of cutting Harry and Dudley's moment, they build up suspense very well, starting with Scrimger's very intense dialogue. We, ever your servants, will continue to defend your liberty and repel the forces that seek to take it from you. And after that scene, they build even more suspense as we see Hermione leave, Harry watch the Dursleys leave, and see Ron at the burrow, all while having a very intense score, much like when the music built up at the end of Harry and Ollivander's conversation. But in part one, all of that momentum that they built is wasted. It immediately cuts to a very slow scene in Malfoy Manor, a scene that is all dialogue and no music. Do you bring news, I trust? It will happen Saturday next, at nightfall. And obviously they have to add that, because that's a main chunk of the story. But what they should have done was had a much slower intro, add the scene with Harry and Dudley, and maybe even add that scene with Harry and Petunia, and then have the action pick up with the Battle of Seven Potters. So as you can see, Part 2 did a very good job building that suspense and using that momentum to get us into the film, while Part 1 just wasted all the momentum they worked so hard to build. Going back to the deleted scenes in part 2, there is another example of them being very aware of how to keep the momentum going, and that is the scene when the trio is in the hog's head with Aberforth. The original scene that they shot was slow and calming, and it really made the suspense of riding a dragon and deciding to go to Hogwarts really dim out. They're all sitting down, and everyone's voice is sort of monotone. Oh, unless you fancy joining him, I would forget about any job he gave you. But luckily they reshot it, made everyone stand up, and had Aberforth almost yell his lines, making the scene much more intense. That's a boy's answer. A boy who goes chasing horcruxes on the word of a man who wouldn't even tell him where to start. You're lying! So instead of slowing the energy down, it actually sort of picks it up even more, which in turn gets us even more hype for the final fight at Hogwarts. And once again backtracking, if we go back to how the Prince's tail and Neville killing Nagini was cut, this was so well done because none of this came from the book. And what I mean by that is in the book, these scenes were all separate. They weren't together at all. Neville did not kill Nagini while Harry was fighting Voldemort. He killed Nagini while making his speech, and Harry fought and defeated Voldemort about 10 or 15 minutes after that. It was a genius move by the filmmakers to put these scenes together. Also, Snape never went to Godric's Hollow in the book. That was not a memory. That incredible scene was fully created by the filmmakers, and as I said, by using that b-roll and cutting it together the way they did made all the difference. Those weren't the only changes the movie made, however. I know I roasted some of the other movies for making changes, but the key word I used there were pointless changes. The changes they made in this film actually enhance the characters and make some scenes make a lot more sense than in the book. As I said in my Order of the Phoenix video essay, I absolutely love what the films did with Luna, and I think incorporating her in more scenes was a great idea, especially with the talent that Ivana Lynch brings to the screen. And the additions that they made to Luna's character in this film were all extraordinary. I love that they made her have a relationship with the Grey Lady, because just like Luna, the Grey Lady is a very different person that most people look at differently, so having them be friends was a really great addition. In the books, this was not the case, as Harry was the one to come up with what Luna did in the film. There's not a person alive who's seen us. It's obvious, isn't it? We have to talk to someone who's dead. 
and nearly headless Nick was the one that pointed Harry in the right direction to find the Grey Lady. I also love that they made Luna and Neville have a thing, which again was not in the book. That was another thing the filmmakers added. The two of them have great chemistry in the books, and in real life, Ivana Lynch and Matthew Lewis have incredible on-screen chemistry, so it just made perfect sense for the two of them to be together, despite the fact that Rowling confirmed that Luna ended up with Newt Scamander's grandson, Ralph Scamander. Another change that I really enjoyed was Snape's last words. In the book, his final words were, look at me. But in the film, they added the incredibly powerful final words of, You have your mother's eyes. A phrase that had been uttered many times throughout the series, and it was very fitting that Snape was the final one to say these words in the eight films. And the change that I liked the most might be the most controversial one, Harry breaking the Elder Wand. I've talked about this before, but I just think it makes much more sense for him to break it than to put it back in Dumbledore's tomb the way he did in the book. Harry's reasoning for putting it in the tomb was that when he died a natural death, the power of the wand would be broken because no one could win its allegiance. There are just so many plot holes with this, because if Harry is simply disarmed, whoever disarmed him becomes the rightful owner of the wand, just as we saw with Draco when he disarmed Dumbledore and when Harry disarmed Draco. And Harry goes on to be an Auror, and with a job like that, where he hunts dark wizards, it's more than likely someone is going to disarm him somewhere down the road. And if you count the piece of crap that is the cursed child as canon, which most fans don't, myself included, because it wasn't written by JK and it's just awful, but I already made a video on that. Anyway, in the cursed child, Harry is disarmed by Delphi, Voldemort's daughter, meaning she would be the rightful owner of the Elder Wand. And according to JK, the story is canon, so it just doesn't make sense. Snapping the wand just closes so many plot holes and it gets rid of the wand forever, the thing they were trying to do in the first place. The final scene of the film was really well done as well, because first we get super nostalgic seeing the trio at Hogwarts for the last time. I'm also so glad that they used the same actors for the 19 years later scene. That was one thing I was really worried they were going to mess up when I went to see the film at its midnight premiere. They did a great job with everyone's makeup though, and I think the casting of the kids was beyond perfect. The girl who got to play Lily Luna literally looks like a mix of Daniel Radcliffe and Bonnie Wright. This film really stands out as a fantastic finale, not just for the Harry Potter film franchise, but when compared to all finales in all different franchises. It was able to make a lot of changes without straying too far from the source material, and pretty much every change they made either complemented or added a lot to the overall story being told. This truly is a masterpiece, and it tied all eight films together in a flawless way, making up for past mistakes, paying tribute to previous films and locations, and of course paying tribute to the book series and giving Harry Potter fans a truly magnificent ending. Thank you so much for watching guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and see more of this little dude. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook for Movie Flame updates. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured in the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you press that like button and subscribe. And look out for more great videos on the way.